I talk to you about tonight. Um, how many of you know the story of the Hatfields and the McCoys? Raise your hand. Okay, if you're older than me, you probably know it. You may not. None of you know this story? There's a few. It's, they went on for a long, long time. And there's a family by the name of Hatfield and a family by the name of McCoy. And there's a running feud going on between them. Let me give you some information about them. So a member of the McCoy family, there's a dispute, and um, one of them stabbed the other one, um, and then shot in the back. Okay, so you see where this is going. This is not a friendly argument about somebody's property. This is this has gotten really serious. So then one of the Hatfield family's members got upset. They took some of the McCoy family, and they tied them to some briar bushes. And as if that wasn't bad enough, they shot them 50 times. You're like, okay, this is really bad. They determined that just a little bit. So then the Hatfields ambushed the McCoy's house. They set the house on fire in an attempt to drive the leader of the other family out. When that didn't work, they went in and beat up his wife. And they finally found him and shot him. And you're thinking, this is just a great story for you to tell us. You know what the whole thing was about? It was about a pig. The whole feud was over a pig. One family member had a pig that they were going to sell, and they would notch the ear of the pig in a certain way to identify it, kind of like you brand a cow. Well, the pigs had notches on their ears, and there was an argument about whose pig it was, Hatfields and McCoys. That whole thing brewed over to the point where now, even hundreds of years later, people remember the Hatfields and the McCoys because of this argument, this feud among them. And it all started by arguing over who owned a pig. So that being said, if you've got your Bibles with you, open up James chapter 4, I mean verse 1 through 3. I want you to think about something. If you think arguing over a pig could ever lead to something like that, or if you think arguing over a pig could never lead to something like that, I want you to think about some of the stuff that James tells us. James chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? Your passions are at war within you. You desire, you don't have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Now, I'll give you a little bit of background here. James, brother of Jesus, right? Living in a great household. Think about it. If you're growing up with Jesus, You've always got that older brother to deal with, right? Like, why can't you be more like your brother? But James was one of the writers of the New Testament in this particular book. And James is dealing with a group of Christians. This was one of the earliest books of the New Testament. So when you read stuff in James, he's dealing with believers who were still around, still, who were alive at the time of Christ. This is around 44 AD. So after Christ's death and resurrection, the people in James's church would in all likelihood, if they hadn't seen Jesus, they would at least have heard the stories firsthand from somebody who had. And already James is talking to these people about there's fighting, there's quarreling, there's division among you. And so James is, even in the earliest church, is dealing with some stuff that you might say to yourself, well, this never happens here, right? This doesn't happen at Cross Point Church. This happens at other churches down the street, right? We never argue with each other. We never fight. We never get into disagreements glad. But I want you to think about something. James is writing this to a group of Christians because he sees in them a problem that started small and got bigger. It got to the point where it made him greatly worry about whether they were truly Christians or not. Okay? Now I'm not addressing a specific issue that I've seen here. I'm addressing this because I think it's really important for us to listen to what James had to say and ask ourselves does this apply to me today? Is there something in my life where I've got quarreling, fighting, and that sort of thing going on? Because just like the Hatfields and the McCoys, it starts over something small. It starts over a pig. And it ends up with people burning each other's houses down and shooting each other. Now, I don't expect anybody here is going to come burn somebody's house down. Right? Nobody's going to chance to come Nobody's going to burn our house down. Nobody, I hope. But I want you to think about what James is telling these people. The biggest issue that James is trying to point to is what is the beginning, what is the source, what is the origin when you're having fighting and conflict with somebody else? And James tells us it's the sinful desires and passions in our heart are the cause of all sorts of conflicts that we have. Now, here's three things I want you to get out of this. 
Every one of us has passions. That's desires. That's things that you want, things that you find important to you. But our passions can lead us to shameful desires. That's number one. And number two, shameful desires can lead us to do dumb things. And the result of all these is that our prayers are unanswered. Because James is talking to believers. And he's telling them, hey guys, you've got passions at war within you. And your passions can, if you don't watch, can lead you to do really dumb things. And ultimately, what's the result of that? Your relationship to God is hindered to the point where your prayers aren't even answered. Or maybe in the case of sometimes you may not even pray to God because you've realized you've got an issue with it. So here's what I want you to think about. A couple of things just as we read through this passage. James says, he uses some words here that don't describe petty arguments. James says, he's talking about quarreling and fighting. Verse 1, he says, what causes quarrels and fights among you? The words he uses aren't asking what caused you to nitpick over what somebody was wearing or what caused you to get a little offended about the words. The words he's using, he's saying what causes, what causes wars among you? This is literally the word used for a, a non-stop national conflict. You can imagine the war with ISIS, right? That I hope one day is going to get resolved. But that's a non-stop conflict. But it also has times when it gets really bad. You look at any war. You look at World War II. Look at World War I. Look at Korea, Vietnam. Look at the war in Iraq. It was a period of time, but it had points when it was really, really bad. Right? The war was constant, but there were times when you thought, oh man, this just got really, really terrible. That's what he's talking about in the church. He says if you've got a brewing issue with somebody, if you've got a conflict with somebody in the church, it's always boiling under the surface, and sometimes you just can't control yourself and it blows up. Anybody in this room, I think, can, can realize if you've got a beef with somebody, if you've got anger, animosity, hatred towards somebody, you can hide it for a while, right? You can kind of suppress it and act Christian, right? But there's a certain point they're going to get on your nerves, or you're going to get tired of hiding it, and it's going to blow up. And when it does, it's pretty ugly. This is kind of the thing James is pointing to. He says, when that sort of stuff happens, when you've got an undercurrent of anger towards somebody and it's blowing up from time to time, he says, where does it come from? He says, it's coming from your passions that are at war within you. Um, this is a big deal. Um, the Hatfields and the McCoys, why were they going around shooting each other? Because somebody wanted that pig, right? It started out small. But the whole thing went on for a long time. This happened over a period of years. This wasn't just like over a period of six months, they argued about a pig, and then all of a sudden everybody broke out the guns and it was a heated exchange. This happened over years, even to the point where some of the original players had already died, and some of their family members, two and three generations down, were still holding a grudge, so they couldn't even remember what the original argument was about. But they were still mad about it. When you think about pleasure, what do you think about Because James says it's our pleasures at war within us or the reason that we have quarreling and fighting. What do you think about when you think of pleasures? I think of nice stuff, right? I think of good things. I think of all these drinks sitting at my disposal, right? That would be very, very pleasant. Take all these drinks home. I don't have to worry about anything to drink tonight. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's using a word that means things that you chase after that are not in your best interest, right? Now, there's things that you can find pleasurable in your life that are God-honoring. But there are also things you can chase after that really aren't God-honoring. For example, how many of you would like to have a Maserati? Everybody raise your hand. Everybody, if you don't even know what it is, just raise your hand anyway. Everybody wants a Maserati, okay? But if you had to go into debt, or if you even had to rob a bank to get that Maserati, your desire, which might have not been a bad thing, your desire has now become a bad thing. Because you are going to have to use sinful means to get it. Is anybody here getting a Maserati? There's not anybody on the schedule to get one. Okay. So pleasure by itself is not sinful. But a single-minded focus on your pleasure, to the extent that you don't do anything God-honoring, that all you think about is getting your pleasures, that's sinful. Jesus said in Luke 8, uh, he was talking about the parable of the seed and the sower. He said that there's seed that's scattered among thorns and the people that hear it, as they go on their way, 
What they've heard has been choked up by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and the fruit doesn't mature. Jesus says, if we have pleasures of life, they can actually be such a focus in our mind that they choke out even being fruitful as a Christian. James says our pleasures can actually be the source of a war and a conflict among our members, right? So even though pleasure is not sinful in itself, we've got to have an understanding that our desires and our pleasures don't line up with God's, and we start chasing that rabbit too far, we can actually allow our pleasures to lead us into sin. Uh, have any of you guys read the book 1984? Is this a required reading anymore for anybody? No one? Ever? Really? <laughs> really? I hope you read it. Okay, anybody know what 1984 is about? It's a George Orwell's book about, and this was written in the 50s, but it was written about a time that he saw in the future where the government was going to impose all kinds of rules and restrictions and they were going to clamp down on people through suffering and misery. Okay? That was his vision of how the world was going to finally, I guess, come under control was through oppression. There's another book uh, by a guy named Huxley. It's called Brave New World. I don't know if anybody here's read it. He had totally opposite view. He said, no, the world's going to come under submission because everybody's going to chase after their greatest pleasure. You're not going to be controlled by what's hurtful to you. You're going to have so much access to so many things that you like that you'll never think twice about another person around you. You'll be so self-focused that you'll never worry about actually doing anything good to your neighbor. Okay? What's the greatest way that Satan suppresses and manipulates Christians? It's not through our pain. It's through our pleasures. It's the things we want that Satan uses those as a means to get us distracted from the whole reason we're here, which is make disciples, preach the gospel, bring people to know Christ. Well, wars and fighting and faction, James says, this stuff's coming from your own pleasures. And that's, Satan gives us access to those things in a way to marginalize us. So, pleasures can lead to shameful desires. But here's the second thing. Your shameful desires can lead you to do really dumb things. James says that we desire things and we don't have them, so we murder. And then we cut it and we can't get what we want, so we fight with each other. Now, I don't know if James is really talking about people murdering each other in his church. There were people in James's church who were called zealots. Okay, They came out of a background where fighting was acceptable. Is that what he's talking about? Well, it could be. Uh, maybe he's talking about other ways. I mean, think about this. You can murder somebody in the flesh, but also, have you ever murdered somebody's reputation? Have you ever trash-talked somebody who's another professing Christian, and you've talked about them in such a way that their reputation's been brought down in the mud? Now, that's, a, that's hard. That's hard to hear. But this is one of the things I think we need to ask ourselves. Okay, James wrote this in 44 AD to a bunch of Christians, and yet right now, we're in a church, a bunch of Christians together, and yet we have the same potential that we can murder somebody's reputation with our words. And James says our tongue is like full of poison. It's literally one of the hardest things to control that you really can't control. So think about this. Fighting, faction, our desires are within us. They lead us to do dumb things, even to the point where we may not kill other people, but we certainly can slay their reputation. And here's another thing. You can destroy your relationship with somebody who loves you for your actions. You can. You have friends. You have other people around you who are followers of Christ. But you can, if you press it long enough, if we're hateful, if we're chasing after our desires to the point where we ignore other people's needs, we can actually get to the point where the people around us might be nice to us because they have to, but they're not going to be nice to us because they want to. You know what I mean? We can actually murder a relationship with another Christian by the way we act toward them. Okay. So our, our desires can lead us to do dumb things. But here's the kicker. The result of all this is that our prayers aren't answered. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I pray a lot. Uh, and God doesn't always answer my prayers the way I want Him to. Has anybody in here ever had God not answer a prayer the way you wanted to? If you've ever prayed for anything, you've got to realize that at some point, the answer that God gives is either no, yes, or not now. It's better to have God tell you no for something that's going to harm you than it is for God to tell you yes. Right? We want our Heavenly Father to actually do what's right for us. But here's the thing. 
if our only thought were self-consumed with our desires. And this is leading us to shameful actions, doing dumb things, saying hateful things to people, quarreling and fighting. We're not really thinking with a godly perspective, are we? What are we going to pray for when we're in that situation? We're going to pray for things that we want. We're not necessarily going to pray for the things that God wants. So that's why James says that in this situation, you don't get what you pray for. Why? Because you ask and yet you ask so that you can spend it on your own motives, right? It's like asking for the Maserati. At some point, if you keep asking God to give you something that you don't really need, when he doesn't answer that prayer, what are you going to do? Stop asking. You're going to say to yourself, God's not answering my prayer. Well, if God doesn't answer your prayer because our motives are focused on sinful things, we're more likely to just stop praying to God at all. So what do we do then? Here's the question. You're... Your heart is a battleground right now. Your heart is the obvious place where this war is happening. Uh, Romans 7, John preached about that last week, uh, two weeks ago. He says, Paul's talking about, I've got these desires in my heart to do the right thing, and yet I'm not doing it. Then I've got desires not to do something, and yet I'm doing it. Paul talks about this battleground in his heart. Galatians talks about your heart's got a battle going on. Now, here's the question I want to ask you. Do worldly desires battle in the heart of a Christian? Yeah. Paul talked about it. Galatians talks about it. You and I have got a heart that's in a battle. Peter told the Christians at his town, he said, you need to abstain from sinful desires. So yes, the heart of a Christian, it's, it's, in, a, it's in a conflict. We're wrestling with a lot of different things. There's a double nature in this. We've got a sin nature. And we've got a spirit nature. We've got an enemy in our hearts. Uh, if you are following Christ, if you're a professing Christian, you've actually made yourself more of a target. Why? Because the enemy does not attack people who are not a threat to him. So you might say to yourself, okay, you're talking about all this stuff about battles raging within us and my words and my actions leading me to do sinful things against other Christians. Why do I even feel this way? Why am I having these desires for sinful things? Why am I tempted by the things of the world? If you're a professing Christian, if you said, I follow Christ, guess what? You're now the target of Satan. And what's going to pop up in your mind? All those things, those pleasures, are going to lead you away from the truth of what Christ wants you to do. That's why we have those battles. So what do you do? How do we change? Here's the easy answer. Jesus, right? There's the church answer. But what are we supposed to do? More than that. Humble ourselves under the hand of God and ask Him to show us what are the things in my life that I'm chasing after? What are the pleasures? What's the pig in my life that I'm fighting over so much that's going to lead me to hating somebody to the point of even murder? Jesus said, if you hate your brother, you're in danger of judgment. First right? John says that whoever hates his brother is a murderer. What's the pig you're chasing after? What's the thing that you've got right now in your life that's so important to you? Is it pride? Is it the reputation of other people? Is it even something good, like your spiritual strength? Is that something that you have so much pride in that you're actually willing to argue with people about it? I've done that before. I've gotten into spiritual arguments with people because I thought I knew more about the Bible than they did. That was my pig, right? That's the thing I had to deal with. Every one of us has got something that we find pleasurable we chase that too far, it's going to lead us into fighting and quarrels and factions. But God fulfills the desire of those who fear Him. This is Psalm 145. He says He also hears the cry of those and He saves them. So what do we need to do? Humble ourselves under the hand of God. Humble ourselves under Christ. And if you've got a desire, if you've got something you're chasing, give it up to God. Why? Now you're the person next to you more than you got it yourself. Make sense? Okay. I'm going to stop there. Let's pray. Lord, every one of us has pleasures and desires, passions that wage war within us, uh, things that lead us away from the truth of the gospel. We've got things within our heart 
that we want. They may be good things. They may be bad things. But either way, Lord, you're leading us away from the ultimate good, the ultimate glory of Christ. And as we're together as a body of believers, Lord, I pray that this week, this month, you would help us see that in ourselves. That if there are passions in our heart, waging war, things that we want, and we're willing to go to war with another Christian about it, I pray God you'd show us. I mean, I pray God you'd change us. We want, Lord, to grow more and more into the image of your Son. We want, Lord, to be made right with you both now and into all eternity. So I pray, Lord, show us these things, these areas in our life in which we need to change. And then I pray, God, let us not be so proud as to think that we cannot give these things up for me. I pray, Lord, that we would put these things at the foot of the cross and that we would crucify those pleasures of the flesh and that we would humble ourselves under your hand. I pray this, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen.